I, Adam Abaro. Do swear. Do swear. The journey was unlikely. It was improbable as it is astounding. On January 19th, 2017, President Adam Abaro was sworn in as the third president of the Republic of the Gambia at the country's embassy building in Dakar, Senegal. His election on December 1st, 2016 took the entire world by surprise. Incumbent President Yahya Jammeh called to concede defeat and congratulate Adama Barrow as president-elect. I'm calling you to wish you all the best. The Gambian people have spoken and have no reason to contest the will of the Almighty Allah. A new era has dawned on the country. The beginning of a new beginning for the Gambia. A country once gripped in fear has suddenly set itself free. Political prisoners went home to their families and loved ones. New media frenzy sprung into life. Freedom, liberty and dignity returned to the Gambia. But Jammeh's acceptance of the election results didn't last long. A week later, he made a full turnaround, announcing an attempt to annul the results of the election. The country was thrown into chaos and total confusion. President Eric Burrow was yet to assume office. But he and his coalition partners Remain resolute and steadfast. He called on Jammeh to accept the verdict of the people. The outgoing president has no constitutional authority to reject the result of the election and order for fresh election to be held. The Independent Electoral Commission is the only authority empowered by the constitution to declare results and to declare winner. And that has happened. That's the language of the constitution. The Gambian people have decided and their decision is supreme. Power must be transferred to the winner. An impasse ensued and the country was at the brink of war. Regional leaders and others around the world stood by the Gambian people and ensured democracy and the rule of law prevailed. President Baru returned to the Gambia to a hero's welcome. He proceeded to constitute a broad-based cabinet, mainly of his coalition 2016 partners and nominees. The new government was faced with the task of rebuilding a broken economy and fixing a bloated and dysfunctional civil service. Immediately after the coalition government came to office, our first priority was to reopen the Gambia to the world. One of the first steps undertaken was to establish the rule of law by releasing all political prisoners and set up a review panel on wrongful dismissal and decongest the office of the president. This was to allow the experts and technicians to deal with issues in a professional manner and provide technical advice to the office of the president. Prior to the, the administration of President Adam Abaro, um, everything in the public service was centralized. Everything was centralized. All the reasons, you know, you cannot imagine the level of this, the reasons that high and low, every reason was taken from this office. The office was congested. Everything, you could not accomplish anything unless you had approval from the office of the president. But um, that was not a good, good practice. Because of that, power was centralized in one person and the whole office was decongested. But um, it's not good practice. So when the current administration came into office, they tried to follow the due process and decongested the office of the president. All the departments were allowed, you know, to exercise, you know, their mandate according to the various acts which set them up. So in doing so, we were able to um, restore sanity in the, in the public service. We were able to restore confidence in the public service. So that now people are free to use their initiative, to use their creativity to improve, to improve um, the work performance. The working environment, I believe, is improving because that is the ultimate goal we want. We want a civil service system that is transparent, that is competent, that is professional, 
that also follows rules and regulations based on fair play for people to self-actualize and for us to achieve our objectives. Today, civil servants, you know, at least have more confidence to work in their respective areas. And, uh, and this is very important, that if people are given all the, uh, the, the resources, they are given the, the latitude to uh, come up with initiative uh, to improve whatever they are doing. You know, in the past, we all witnessed what happened in the past, to the extent that everybody is scared. You are even scared to take initiative. You just allow the status quo, uh, nothing more. Uh, nobody want to challenge the status quo. Nobody want to uh, change the status quo because if you do, because you know it doesn't aff favor someone, that person, even a driver, you know, can 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 cause your dismissal. The reform program is wide and encompassing and addresses a lot of areas uh, with a view to improving performance in the civil service. And um, it looks at um, pay and grading. It looks at performance management. It looks at pensions. You know, it looks at um, reviewing the rule books, the general orders, the public service um, uh, regulations, um, the code of conduct. All these things were, you know, revised uh, with a view to uh, improving uh, performance in the civil service. 2017, the PMO conducted a general staff audit, the whole civil service-wide uh, staff audit. Uh, that accounted for over 3,000 uh, ghost workers. And uh, this... Uh, uh, save government over 10 million dollars a month in terms of wrongful salary payments. You know, again in 2019, PMO conducted another staff audit. Uh, again, we saved government close to 8 million dollars on account of ghost workers. That's the time we came out and worked out a model to increase the salary of the workers. And we are not stopping there. We are now doing salary review. By July, I have spoken to my Minister of Finance. By July, you would have implemented the salary review. The civil service reforms are very impactful in what we are doing. Because when we came, we found that it is unbelievable that a pensioner will be receiving $150 or $300 per month after serving your country for almost 30 or 25 years. The 50% salary increase for the civil servants and the 100% increase for the pensioners included this year is the Alcalos and Chiefs. That is just the tip of the iceberg. We are coming back and this time we are saying it is bottom up approach. The most vulnerable, the most ignored citizens of this country will be the priority. The new government also quickly set out to fix the country's battered international image and broken relationship with development partners. President Baro led several high-ranking delegations abroad to rebuild the country's relation with friends and partners around the world. He visited the United Kingdom, the first of such visit by a president of the Gambia in over two decades where he had meetings with the Queen and other high-ranking British government officials. The Gambia also rejoined the Commonwealth and re-engaged the European Union, two important development partners. The Barrow administration also cancelled the country's notice to exit from the International Criminal Court and also revoked the attempt to change the country's name. My government continues to build on its diplomacy to return the Gambia into the rightful place in the community of nations and organizations. One of these is the Commonwealth. And we are delighted by the readmission of the Gambia into the Commonwealth of Nations. There is no nation that can live today in isolation. We are part and parcel of the international community. And if we decide to exclude ourselves, it's to our own detriment. And I think the wise decision was taken by the president to get us back into the Commonwealth, into ICC, and then chart the way forward based on our participation in effectively in all these international organizations. We want to be friendly to all the countries around the world. That's why we are engaging all countries in the world. Our diplomacy is a very friendly one. That's why today Gambia is benefiting. So our position is to foster peace, 
based on neutrality and uh, work together as one big human family, trying to put emphasis on things that bind us together rather than uh, things that will divide us. I've been in this for, for quite a while now, though I'm young. I, I know sometimes the work of our diplomats are not easy, with little resources. And what makes the difference is the dynamism of our diplomats. And you follow the election of the Gambia to the Human Rights Council, of Madame Janet Salanjai to the African Commission. I think our ambassadors deserve a lot of commendation for the excellent work they are doing, with very limited resources. We have a very, very good connection as far as ECOWAS is concerned. That's why today, as we speak, Gambia is expecting to be, we are already, we will be the president of ECOWAS for the next four years. President Barrow came face to face with the dire conditions in the country, the grossly inadequate electricity supply, the bad conditions of the roads, particularly in Banjul and the Kanfing municipality, and the near total absence of a national infrastructure in many parts of the rural areas. Expectations were high. President Baru and government knew they had to act quickly to address the situation. And controlling the electricity supply in the country was fundamental. When we came, the infrastructure was very, very old, and we were challenged with a lot of things. Our generators were old, our infrastructure was old, so we needed to fix all of them at the same time. The government people protested against me after six months because our capacity was 40 megawatts. Today, we are up to 100 megawatts. The TND, we are losing up to 21% along when we are transmitting. That alone was very, very, very serious, very bad. And when I was coming, Electricity costs were between 17 to 19 times a day. Today is less than two to three times a day. It's because we improve on the infrastructure. We took over when it was like 45 uh, megawatts um, available. Now we are more than 90 megawatts. And uh, we are planning to increase more uh, through the OMV interconnection. Before the end of December, we would have connect the Birkama substation and the Jarasoma substation. And immediately we will access 50 megawatts from the dam in Guinea, that is Suapiti and Kaleta. What we need as a country is 80 megawatts at that time. So if we access 50 megawatts plus the car power 30, combined will be 80. So that means we will shut down our engines. As the World Bank said, we will shut down dirty electricity. We depend on clean energy. And that is even very good for the, uh, for the environment. We want to make so people access electricity. And in this roadmap, by 2023, Gambia have universal access to electricity. Basically, we are targeting about 85% of Gambians to access electricity. Because electricity is a game changer. We are electrifying uh, more than 200 uh, communities in the Sierra and we are area. We also have the ECOWAS you know, project, which is connected to the OMVG. There's also an access project to get access to the communities. That also more than 200 uh, um, communities to be collected from um, Soma Substation and Milkama Substation. So North Bank Division, LRR, and West Coast Region will benefit from, from that project. I'm happy because we have electricity in our, in our village here. And the benefit is at that time we use candle to study. But as now, you can see we have electricity. We have having light so we can use it to study well. Most of the people are migrating from their villages, going to the cities and towns. 
but the moment they have electricity, there is no need for them to move because they have gotten whatever they want to do back home. So that's why the universal access should be by 2023. By 2025, the whole country should access electricity. And if you look on, uh, looking at the target for Africa, one of the SDGs is 2030, universal access. But with Gambia, we will achieve that five years earlier. When President Barrow Azim office, he found the country's economy in really bad shape. Financial discipline was out of the window. The government operated several accounts opening the public purse to corruption and unauthorized expenditures. Worse still, the bad governance environment under the previous government had led to a big drop in the amount of support the country was receiving from its development partners. The economy was broken. There were a lot of uncertainties. If you look at the economy at that time, growth was between 1 to 2 percent. But along the journey, today, growth is about 6.1 percent. Our debt to GDP was 120 percent. Today, we are around 66. At that time, Treasury bills, interest rates, we are at 23 percent. Today, interest rates have gone down to 4 percent. Banks, we are lending at 30 percent. Today, it has reduced by 50 percent. Now, banks lend between 15 and 16 percent. Our income that we generate, we struggle to to collect 500 million per month. Along the journey now, we are collecting up to 1.2 billion. That means our collection have increased by 100% plus. The debt situation has really been mind boggling in the sense that five years ago, we were talking about almost 129 percent. Now we were we are talking about 78 percent within that range. I think what has been realized is the fact that the policies that have been in place in revisiting number one the way we manage our economy. We insisted that debts are no more for consumption but it will be more, more of an investment. And through our fiscal discipline, we have been able to contain the expenditure, and the expenditures were also directed to sectors. For the first time in the history of the Gambia, I believe the taxpayers' money are known to be spent on them. Quite a number of uh, projects that are going on are being spent out of the taxpayers' money. Because we were above the ceiling, we couldn't access loans at that time. But as we improve, the IMF accepted us to accept loans that attract minimum 50% interest rates. Now we can access loan at 30%. But we are very hopeful that very soon Gambia will access loan that will attract zero percent interest rates we are working towards that growing up in rural gambia president Barrow has lived through the experience of the near absence of utility services and suitable infrastructure in many parts of the country particularly the rural areas to address the vast development deficits in the country President Barrow and his government came up with a national development plan. And out of the NDP master plan, President Barrow outlined key sectors that needed urgent attention. 
This led to a policy aimed at bridging the infrastructure development gap between the rural and urban parts of the country. Preston Barrow's No Community Left Behind policy is aimed at ending what he called the injustice of excluding certain parts of the country benefiting from national infrastructure and utility services. President Barrow's determination to fix the road deficit in the country, particularly in the rural areas, became one of his signature projects in his first term. Infrastructural development was my priority, because that is my background. Along the way, I came to understand that without infrastructural development, there cannot be any meaningful development. The URR Ring Road and bridges stand out among these projects. Bridging the River Gambia between Basse and Wuli to connect URR North and South and end centuries old suffering of people crossing the river in makeshift boats is huge. Besides the URR Ring Road and bridges that finally brought the country's vast eastern region into the national highway system, there remain several communities of the highways. President Barrow and his government have laid the foundation for the construction of feeder roads in the rural and urban areas. We all know that when His Excellency took over, the, the main talk was about the National Development Plan, NDP. And the NDP was supposed to be donor funded up to $1.7 billion and we went to Brussels and there was all kinds of pledges but for one thing and the other aside the fact that it would have taken a long time to get the financing the COVID happened and everything collapsed so we could have said well we had this plan of the NDP I mean uh, there is COVID we should stop you know we should wait until and then this five year of his presidency would not have accomplished much but he did not stop there. We did not stop there. We have been able to increase revenue. We have been able to reduce the consumption. We have been able to redirect our resources, not for lavish spending. But these are critical areas that we have been able to make savings. We also have instruments now. That's what we call the innovative financing, in the sense that what we are now issuing, example, the bonds that we were issuing, the rates before, you're talking about 20-something percent. Because we were able to have issue bonds into the market, which was oversubscribed, it has gone down to single digits. These are the sort of new instruments that we're using in order to be able to finance our infrastructure. Normally, when we talk about road project, we usually approach um, donors to implement I mean, big projects or projects of, you know, amounts that are beyond a certain level. The problem here with the Hakalang and the uh, Salum roads was that if we had gone the traditional way of going to donors and asking for financing, we would not have been able to start it. The road network, very close to my heart very important for that matter because the road network is connected basically to everything we do in life if you want to access the health facilities there must be good road network if you want to access security time is very important here trade without good road network trade will be difficult if you look at the infrastructural development of these roads you look at the bridges, let's say the Farafenji Bridge, the Senegambia Bridge. People used to spend one week, two weeks, they cannot cross the bridge. So if you look at that time, now you spend less than 30 minutes, five minutes, you come and cross. How much money have you saved? Because of the time, time it was consuming. I can give you one example, Blackstone. Before the opening of the bridge, price of Blackstone rise to 120,000 per trip. 
Today, the trip is between 60 to 65,000. It has reduced by half because of the time. They used to travel twice only for the truck, two trips for the month. Now, a trip takes you maximum two days. You go today, tomorrow you come back. So you see, and in marketing, it's so demand and supply. Now the supply is higher than the demand, so it will affect the price. That's why the price is coming down. That's why we liberalize the market also, so that there will be competition. So naturally, the market takes care of itself without government intervention. I may be biased, but I am one of those people who believe that one of the reasons for poverty, one of the reasons for lack of development is lack of connectivity. You know, if, in other words, Africa is underdeveloped, most countries are underdeveloped because they are not connected. I mean, communities are not connected and uh, there is no free flow of people, goods and services. And one way to remedy this is to provide roads, bridges, railways, or um, aviation connection. In fact, I am one of those who believe that the much talked about African unity cannot, be, cannot happen politically without this connectivity happening. You know, so we, in, a, in our own national level, that's what we are doing right now. That's the key important. We want to connect Gambia. Gambians, Gambian communities, Gambian people, to, to have more economic social interaction. Access schools, access farmlands, access, you know, health centers, things like that. And without that, there is no, our development will still be constrained if you don't address that. So that's what we have been doing, more or less, connecting the country. Now, if you notice, you can travel from SL up to Pasemas. That covers almost the whole entire North Bank. You can travel from Banyul to Koina. That, you know, connects the whole South Bank. We are bridging these two main trunks as well. In, in uh, Senegambe Bridge, there is Basse, there is Fototo. So, this in itself is the movement of people. And this mere fact that people move brings social and economic development. These roads and bridges uh, are very important and it will impact the life of the Gambian people. One of my friends, a veteran politician, Sidi Ajad, when he came to my office, he said when he used to travel to Wuli, it used to take him hours, 12 hours minimum to get to Wuli. So he said now, if you have a very good driver, it takes you four hours. But if you have a bad driver, it takes you three hours to get to Wuli. It is my slogan that no infrastructure, no development. So infrastructural development is very important. If you're looking at the markets that we build, the environment it have created, the life it have impacted, I think it have made a huge difference in the life of the people. And we will continue doing that in the future for the best interest of the Gambia. And I think Every Gambian will listen to me carefully and understand why infrastructural development. If you want to expand the health sector, you cannot expand it without the infrastructure, without the infrastructural development, without building hospitals, creating the environment. You cannot expand the health sector.
and that's what we are doing. The Barrow administration knew it has to do something about the country's agriculture sector. Over 70% of the country's workforce is engaged in agriculture directly or indirectly. And to help increase production in agriculture, the government launched a massive intervention program to assist farmers and women horticulturalists. We cannot develop agriculture without infrastructure. Right now we are doing a lot of infrastructural development because the canals, we are temporal canals. Now we are building permanent canals that are concrete that can last for years and years and years and it's more efficient, it's more effective. Industrialization is a process and that process are interlinked. We have the value chain also, that is about 80 million dollars, the value chain. That is also about rice production and horticulture. If we don't improve our rice production in this country, it will be difficult for us to be self-sufficient in food production because rice is our stable food. So that project will address rice production in this country. So around uh, CRR, North and South, and the URR, the project is more concentrated in that end because we have fresh water, whereby you can have tidal and also some pump irrigated. Since I assume office, we are able to do a lot through president's support and the JICA, that's the Japanese grant. So they were able to purchase almost 50 tractors so that at least our small scale farmers and the potential farmers can have easy access to plowing. Because uh, without uh, implement, it will be difficult for farmers to have access to plowing. And the land preparation is important. If you don't prepare your land well, you cannot even have bumper harvest. We are starting with storage facilities because we believe that without storage you cannot preserve perishable goods. That's why we are starting with the infrastructural development of storage facilities, countrywide for that matter. The government also is able to have a project which is 80 million US dollar project that one is to enhance agricultural production and the productivity, especially the small-scale farmers, commercial farmers, and the private people to have access. So it's very important because without those kind of projects, it will be difficult for government to do everything. That project is going to establish almost 15 cold storage facilities. So this year, they're going to construct almost three. Then the following year, they're going to construct some again because it's a six-year project. Inatadina. Inata makoi tangoto, ya makoi geto, inata drip line o Kenya ye, nyofele musoli ikonganda haa juli sabola. Ntolibuka julio saba, na insa ate kone jansayin. Ika nale dorong, ya du montaro, talankono nto lenkadu, nindu nita talankono nto, tu elfu lenka ji. Ninjita tu elfu mobe ite la haa jola, ay bata talankane, ay kolea talankang. Wata saa mbe masa kundate ntula mbe jaila, ibo kata kuwa minkieka musoli, fo ala saa kenya ato takuoti, mini masoto, asefuta walifanaya kila hormoti. Katun tolbu kada nyinda mala, mka bebi kwa nfana ndo kule, mi yalo kwa transport kata holani. So bebi kwa na do kuwa mankwalea, ni nga fiduron dripo la abanta. Fo nga binde abanta, jibon nale bijeka jibon doron, tati militi nae gadino yoli doron, gadino nyimbe se supply. Wo na mota doron kakati kata holani, fo ni nkumandine kwenye atala kodo kama airport, nga nakama na amambali na haji dola. Before you said uh, three years to come, will be soft sufficient in food production. That's what we are yearning for. That's our vision. And uh, we want to ensure that agricultural crop production or agriculture sector is being modernized and also commercialized. People to see agriculture as a business, not only farming. Unlike other sectors, President Barrow and his administration set out to revamp and transform the country's health sector from a state of total disrepair and decay. When I came to power, I think about 700 communities access primary health care. Today, about 1,000 communities 
access primary health care and to bring health closer to the people we said we have to build more health facilities right now i'm building up to 24 health facilities renovating up to 26 health facilities countrywide and also to connect them to help the people to access that's why we brought in 80 ambulances we are just having 65 ambulances countrywide so now we have brought in 80 ambulances and this is community ambulances it is meant for the community so that it can help the people who are sick to get to health facilities we inherited hospitals that did not have most of the equipment that the people need. Even the equipment that they had, many of them were obsolete. But we said that status quo couldn't continue. We need to revamp the entire health sector. We started reorganizing uh, the units. We started putting competent people into uh, positions where they could perform optimally uh, for efficiency. That, we believe, has brought in quite a lot of uh, positive change in the health sector. We are going to expand, modernize, and design RPH to world standard facelift for the RPH because we want to create the environment there. The infrastructure was lagging behind. We are also building quarters for doctors. You know, we build for a doctor a two bedroom, sitting room, everything for doctors. And we build houses also for nurses. We call them one bedroom flat. Within your bedroom, you have everything. And we have a central sitting system whereby they can sit together, you know, and chat and everything. People used to deliver together, but now we are building specific rooms for delivery. For one person, you access water, toilet, and everything in there. It's more decent, you know, sir? You know, and it's more uh, secured. The environment is more conducive. So we are doing that. This is the innovative ideas. These are new models. This is world standards, you know, and I think, I think Gambia is moving. We have here this endoscopy, it's metallic esophagoscopy, it's rigid. With this material, we can remove a lot of foreign body here in Gambia. In esophago, it's very important for us because before, we don't have this machine. We have laid the foundation for a whole lot of improvements and achievements that inshallah will continue to make sure that the people of this country get the standard healthcare that we are all yearning for, to get to, to a level that is world class. And government has the resolve, the commitment is there, and the know-how is there, and the strategies are there for us to follow those steps and get there. The affairs of women, children, and disabled have always been placed in the back burner in government business and administration. But two years into the Barrow administration, this trend came to an end with the setting up of a full-fledged ministry to specifically administer issues affecting women, girls and children in the country. Traditionally, women have been marginalized in our society. How do we eliminate that? We have to empower them. And empower them, we have to train them. We have to set up businesses for them. That's why we have the Women Enterprise Fund. And that's why even now we have a Ministry of Women Affairs, stand alone. It used to be with the Vice President, so it does not recognize. The government created the Women Enterprise Fund for the economic empowerment of women. You may all be aware that the majority of women are small and micro entrepreneurs. And one of their challenges is access to finance. With the Women Enterprise Fund, women of the Gambia now are at liberty to apply for funds to run their small and micro enterprises. It is another way also of alleviating poverty. We are all aware that poverty has a woman's face. By that I mean the majority of the poor 
are women. We have reached out to 453 women's groups across the country, and that's 9,000 women beneficiaries. And we have disbursed $17 million to these women. All of this is funded by the government of Gambia under the leadership of President Adama Barrow. More and more Gambian women have access to finance to run their micro and small enterprises. The important thing is here, here is that before giving out the funds, we train them in entrepreneurship, how to run a business, how to start a business, how to run it, how to separate what belongs to the business and what belongs to the family. So they are trained in all this. Flowing with then the money is uh, this put it into their accounts, they withdraw the money, and then they start running their individual or group enterprises. This is important in, in several ways. One, it will alleviate poverty. Two, it will contribute in a very big way towards women's economic empowerment. And as I usually say, women's economic empowerment is synonymous to their economic independence. <laughs> The ultimate aim of this fund is to establish a women's bank and we look forward to creating such a bank in the next five years. I have no doubt that this is possible because we have the support of the government, we have the support of President Adam Barry, he assured us that. Every year we get more funding for the Women Enterprise Fund and we have no doubt that he can provide that to us. Young people constitute the largest chunk of the country's population. And to ensure that this vital segment of the country's demographic is utilized effectively for the advancement of the country. The Barrow administration set out to galvanize the creativity and ingenuity of the youths into the country's development program. There is a big skill gap in this country. That's why we want to train our people to be skillful, build their capacity. January of last year, the president launched the, the youth revolving loan and the, the, the loan and the grant scheme up to the tune of $20 million. And uh, so far we've had uh, a lot of young people that have passed through NEDI and SDF and they've been supported with some uh, between 50,000 to 500,000 to either establish new businesses or to expand on the existing business. And that is also meant to ensure that, um, um, not being xenophobic, but uh, encourage Gambians to take up the informal sector and be the ones that will control the businesses that we have in this country. So all of these are initiatives that um, government have put in place in the last four or five years to ensure that um, our young people are supported, they are empowered and they are trained. It's important for us to have our youth employed because they are migrating. We don't want our youth to migrate. Our biggest trend as a country is our human resource and the youths are the manpower. If they migrate from this country, it will affect our country in the future. We have to make so we make good use of our youths. Uh, one of the biggest achievements in the country is the, the qualification of our national team to the African Cup of Nations for the first time after so many decades of trial. Uh, and, uh, it's based on a lot of factors, but one of the key factors is the investment. Because sports without investment is never going to grow. Uh, president, having realized that, put up a special fund um, to support the sports, and that is what has been financing our national team, and that has contributed greatly towards the, the qualification of the Gambia to the AFCON um, uh, next year uh, in Cameroon. During the qualification period of the AFCON, government spent $105 million in just the qualification, just for the national team. That is different from basketball, different from volleyball. And that is almost close to what we have in our annual budget, as a ministry. Um, uh, the Olympics participation cost government about $5 million. 
And currently, in preparing the team to go to the AFCON, we government have spent more than 25 million in all the training camps in Turkey, uh, uh, in Morocco, and then the upcoming one. So all of these things is not necessarily reflected in the budget, but there are expenses that are coming, and it comes from, from government funding. Having the right education policy and program is fundamental to our country attaining its development objectives. President Barrow and his government places high premium on the academic and vocational education and training of young Gambians for them to effectively serve as the engine of growth of the country's economy. We have established a lot of new schools running from ECD to senior secondary. In nearly all our government schools, we have ECD classes in all our government lower basic schools because studies have shown that uh, early childhood education is very important for quality education. ECD education used to be the area controlled by the private sector, by private schools. And we know that beyond the Greater Banjul area, uh, parents cannot afford to pay for private ECD education. So to address the equity issues in terms of education, the ministry decided to uh, incorporate ECD education into all our lower basic schools. We have achieved a lot as far as education is concerned. We have built the university, the phase one and phase two is finishing now and we are trying to access funds, that is about 22 million, to finish the third, uh, third phase. You know, uh, we have built the Basse College, and we have provided a lot of scholarships to teachers just to build their capacity. Almost 60, 70% of students going to the University of the Gambia are on scholarship. Without the intervention of MOPSI, I wouldn't be able to pay for myself to come and advance my educational career because it is definitely, um, you know, it, it requires a lot, you know, for an individual to, to put together to, to continue with your educational career. We have about 432 students here enrolled in all, all programs. Out of these 432 students, 48% of the students are on scholarship on MRC Holland. MRC Holland gave them scholarship. And uh, about 22% of them uh, were teachers and that they are benefiting from the MOPSI scholarship. They are, they are in service teachers, either in the advanced diploma secondary or advanced diploma primary. And then another scholarship package is also around that is SOS those sponsors some students, and then area councils and other philanthropists. So that is about 10% of the students. So mostly here, it is about 20% of the students that are not on scholarship, and most of them are Islamic students. So once they have the requirement that donors look at, then they are given scholarship. And uh, what is most interesting is some of them are from the communities here, and they have been in their communities doing a lot of things in the communities. They have the requirement, but they have not gone to college. But when this college was established, I can give you typical examples where an imam in Galemanda, one Mr. Job, is enrolled in the college here. He's the imam there, and he is a student here. So that shows that many people have requirement, but due to access, it became a problem. But once the access was there, then it became easy for them. You go to Pasamas also, we have another guy there who is a family man who is having two wives here as a student and is pursuing the diploma program. He also graduated since we don't have the great system. He graduated with Form 4 with very good results. And he's also enrolled here. He's also benefiting from such. So you can see people from diverse walks of life, from different communities in URR and CRR here are benefiting from scholarship. So I think the coming of the college here is very timely. From 2017 to now, you go to CRR, and CRR North in particular, where we had a lot of out of school children. A lot of children were out of school. They started with temporary classrooms. Now you go to places like uh, Kir Alasan, Tamba and all those places in Sierra North, you will find uh, 
permanent beautiful classrooms that have been constructed with water supply, solar system, and all those. But those schools started with temporary structures, makeshift classrooms. But all that has, is, is what has increased the enrollment. If we had left those children out because there were no classrooms, we would not have been talking about enrollment increasing from 500,000 uh, to about 700,000 or over 700,000 now. Uh, we started off with free girls education, but now it is free education for everybody, both boys and girls. Nobody pays school fees from grade one to grade 12. Children can go to school from grade, from ECD, sorry, from ECD to grade 12 and not pay, and they're not expected to pay any fees. It's free education. Tuition free education is what we have in the, in the Gambia now. And apart from that, textbooks are also provided free of charge from grade one to grade nine. And for senior schools, schools are paid $2,000 per student for their textbooks. For examination fees, some of us might understand that uh, there was a time children or students would get up to an examination class and because their parents cannot afford the examination fees, now even that has been waived. Nobody pays for grade 9 exam fees and no student pays for their grade 12 examination fees. It's all free. So that is why everybody has the same opportunity whether you are in uh, the Greater Banjo area or you are in the remotest part of the country. Most of the schools are in remote villages. You know, they don't have enough housing for teachers. So that's why we are building now teachers' quarters for teachers. I think we have built more than 1,000 houses for teachers and we will continue doing that. So that if you are living in a village, you will live as comfortable as somebody who is living in Serekunda. You know, that's why we are talking about decentralization. Decentralization is not the location alone, but to make sure that facilities are the same. You access everything, clean drinking water, you know, electricity, good housing, those kind of things. Decentralization system cannot work if these things are not available. That means you create the environment. If you transfer somebody from Serekunda, he feels that if I, if I move to Basse, it's the same thing. If I move to Koina, it's the same thing. This is what we are trying to do. By the time the Baro administration came into office, the country's tourist industry was on the decline. The brief political impasse only made it worse. But due to the governance environment, the country's tourism sector sprung back into life. As a government, we are faced with these challenges of rebranding our country internationally. Uh, re the narratives of our country, we needed to redo them again and give it a different image. Number one we did was to make sure so you improve on our governance. Because governance is key for any investor in any country. And by making sure so that our narrative become different overseas, that attracted people to put in their money in this country because they know that when they, when they are grieved, they go to court, they will get justice. And that is key in determining investment for any investor in any country. Tourism is very important to our economy. Between 20% to 25% of our GDP is from tourism. And they create employment for about 200,000 people directly or indirectly. So tourism is so important, it's huge. When we came to power, tourism arrivals increase by 28%. With the OIC coming, we are coming to build the biggest and the first full five-star hotel. And also with the conference center, we can use Gambia as a conference destination. So that's why I told you, no infrastructure, no development. Definitely, definitely. We believe Gambia is a, is a right destination that with a little bit more efforts, we will get to where we are heading. During the previous administration, the Gambia's image internationally was synonymous to its government's encroachment and abuse of its media practitioners. 
arbitrary detentions and disappearance and the killing of journalists was widespread. President Barrow came into office with the promise of overseeing the growth of an unfettered media environment in the country. For five years now, the Gambia has sharply risen away from the bottom list of countries with the worst record against journalists and media freedom. To one champion in the cause of a free and open society with high level of media freedom and activity. For the first time in more than two decades, uh, the Gambia has seen uh, continuous progression um, in terms of uh, its ranking um, in the Freedom of Information Index. Also, for the first time in the history of this country, which in fact is a laudable one, the Gambia government came up with uh, the Access to Information Law. This five years ago, in 2016, you know, we are not you know, actually available to Gambians. Sometimes people come to me, I think the freedom is, is, is too much. You know, but uh, we believe that we, we fought very hard uh, to make sure that the media is free. And today, no doubt about that, the media freedom is really working in this country. Well, uh, for, from 94 2016, it was very hard for any journalist working in the Gambia because during that time journalists were killed, media houses were burned and also uh, you don't have that uh, freedom uh, to control your editorial line. You are dictated by the rigid regime of Germany so it was very difficult as a journalist to work uh, professionally. I was arrested many times, and also I was jailed uh, with some colleagues, uh, five other colleagues, and, after, and then after we were pardoned. For the fir first time, we the journalists, uh, we sleep uh, uh, smoothly <laughs> without uh, any fear. Because during Jamie's time, when you had noise, you must get up to, 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 to uh, ask yourself whether that noise, the cars or something like that, they are coming for you. But now, thank God, you, are, you, you, are, you walk or you sleep in peaceful mind. Also, the access of information, uh, at first, there was a segregation to come to State House. Only that time, JRTS and Daily Observer. But now, all the media houses accredited are coming to State House to cover. If you look at uh, the media scene today, you look around, there is no journalist in our jails. There is no journalist behind the bars. There is no journalist who has been forced to run away from this country because of perceived threat or deliberate threat, you know, I mean, uh, or deliberate target by the government, you know, to ensure that dissent is crossed. Rather, what we are doing is to encourage, I mean, our journalists to be the vehicle between the people and the government. And we have been having a very strong collaboration with the press union, with the civil society organizations to ensure that this process is enhanced. The media is important to inform the people accurate information, report as it is. I think that is very, very important. Because the Gambian people want to be informed. We will just advise them to be neutral. Let them report accurate information. We don't want Gambians to be misled. To me, they are our partners in development. You cannot develop without the media. So the media is very important. So you have a very important platform. Make good use of it. It's a very good trade. You can use it as a business but genuine business for that matter, and you can help your country. And I think every media person, every Gambian should love your country. If you love your country, you make so that you help your country. How do you help your country? Giving information that is correct. President Adam Barrow is a very tolerant leader. He's somebody who understands that uh, democracy comes with a price. And that price is that so long you are leading a democratic nation, 
people will criticize a lot of things that you do even though some of those people have very little idea about you know the processes but this is the type of price that you pay when you commit yourself to democratic governance when you you know commit yourself to democratic pluralism everything that Baro does he will talk about the rule of law if it is lawful we can do anything unlawful we cannot do and the atmosphere we created we make sure that our police force respected our arm our security forces respected everybody and everything that was done and the country becomes safe if we had an autocratic president who doesn't listen who thinks that you know it's dictatorship and all that there is no exchange then we will not have been able to accomplish what we accomplished during these five years because it's a lot and the only reason is because of His Excellency Adam Ubaro. He played his role, he played his part. He's one unique leader that um, I guess everybody would want to work under him because he doesn't control the ministries. He allows people to operate. Of course, if you want to deviate from the, his goal and aspiration, he will bring you back. But the most important thing is that ministers are uh, kind of working in a free environment and be able to come up with ideas and discuss with him. And so far, for me being here for a year plus now, Almost everything that we have come up with, I go to him, he will ask questions, but in the end, he gives us the approval to go ahead and do it. And we are appreciative of that kind of leadership, because that is what is allow, allows people to be innovative, to be able to, to think and be able to do the right things. Under the leadership of President Aro Baro, there's a, lot, a brighter future for the young people and the sports family in this country based on the innovative way of financing that we are getting now and the new things that we see happen. We are going to have a new vision. And the president is going to champion vision 2022 to 2050. I think Gambians have every right to be hopeful, especially the youths and women. We have been able to launch this youth and sports levy. And this youth and sports levy has been so instrumental in making sure that we have upgraded the performance of the youths at the national level at the local level, everywhere. I, I would say it has an octopus effect. So we have a right to be confident. The president is very much combative in trying to address the issue of youth unemployment. He's combative he, to, to be able to address the plight of the farmers. Just look at the subsidies. We were subsidizing almost $200 million. This year we are going to, we, the, the next subsidy is $500 million. That is a significant amount. So you talk about youth, you talk about women, you talk about farmers. These are the three categories that I know the president gives a very, very high priority. So I, I, I think, all, all, as the saying goes, there is light at the end of the tunnel, and I think we will reach there sooner rather than later. And the president is the main driver of the bus. Without coming together, it will be difficult for us to develop this country. Our strength is unity. Let us be united as Gambians. I'm on the campaign trail, trying to report back to the people after five years. I'm taking stock. I'm assessing what we have been done for the past and what we have for the Gambian people, the future. But we have a lot for the Gambians in the future. We have the health insurance scheme. You know, we have the fisheries project going on. And also, uh, as our local representative, we're going to pay them salaries for the first time in the history of this country. And also, we are going to implement the salary review that we have done recently by 4th of July and I am promising Gambians that I will continue with my infrastructural development. The sky is the limit for infrastructure in this country. With roads, I will do more roads. I'm promising you I will do over 1,200 kilometers to expand the Gambia, to connect the Gambia as one Asian leaders once said, let's build the roads, the roads will connect us. As Gambians, 
I want us to build the roads so that the roads will connect us. And also we have started the OIC roads. They will expand the urban areas. And the highway we are coming to build in the history of this country will be the first time you have six lane highway in the Gambia. And you will have overhead bridge in the Gambia for the first time. I think when it's completed, the CC Skundar will go and take pictures and say they are in New York. It, this will be, for, it will be the first time in the history of this country. So uh, I seize this opportunity also to thank my government, my cabinet, the National Assembly, the entire Gambian people for the support they have given. And I call on all Gambians to continue supporting me in the future, for the future development of this country, for peace, for stability, for democracy, for transitional justice, for independence of the judiciary, independence of the National Assembly. I want Gambians to continue supporting me, to be the head of state of this country from 2022 to 2026. That's another term of five years. And I believe we can do more than what we did during our five years transition. This will be an NPP-led government. And I believe if you give me support, President will be NPP, National Assembly will be NPP, councillors, mayors will be NPP. Combined, coming together, same direction, same thinking, we can make a huge difference in the life of the Gambian people. Thank you very much. Long live the Gambia and long live Africa.